Welcome to The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis. I am your host, Cicely Davis. You want some savage truth? (laughs) Well, you're going to get it today. (laughs) Hello, America, and welcome back to The Savage Truth. Cicely here. It's a privilege to have you join me today as we dive into some juicy, eventful, never-ending American culture. But before we get into it, as always, please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Please and thank you. The Kansas City Chiefs are Super Bowl champs number 58 again, an inevitable, perhaps unstoppable pace becoming the new NFL dynasty. With a notable winning record since their past win in 1970, they have since won in 2020, 2023, and of course, 2024. Is anyone else out there watching or listening at all like me? After the long-awaited draft, preseason game, game season, the playoffs, then to the ultimate Super Bowl, go through withdrawal once that season is over. I mean, once football is over, I feel a sense of loss, void, emptiness. I mean, basically from August to February, it's Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Saturday, respectfully for college, Football, football, football. It's touchdowns and blitzes and penalties, punts and players and quarterbacks. It's running backs, it's receivers and stats, the announcers, the pregame and the postgame shows, the wins and the losses, the owners, the coaches, the stars, and of course, the fans. I need a moment. I need a moment of silence. Thank you. I can, I will, I have to, I must pull myself together to get to the other cultural content, like the farce of the current Biden administration. Now, if you ask me, it's been a bad administration since the moment they took office in January of 2021, but this has been an especially bad month. Many of us not surprised, others just now waking up to that fact, that savage truth, and others, they're angry and embarrassed about that, and rightfully so. Janet Yellen, the not-so-esteemed Treasury Secretary, presents a stubborn double-down testimony as year-over-year consumer prices, consumers, that's you and me, folks, rose to 3.1% in January. Yellen testified before the Senate that she doesn't expect the prices to go down and that prices, those high prices, were not caused by Bidenomics. As I said, prices are up 3.1% from a year ago. The secretary was also under fire by a gun rights group representing over 2 million members and activists who urged senators to grill Yellen on alleged privacy violations committed by her department. Yellen is set to testify before the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee on Thursday. In a letter sent ahead of her testimony, Gun Owners of America, the GOA, made a request that committee lawmakers press the secretary on recent revelation that federal investigators asked banks to search and filter customer transactions for terms related to the firearms industry. Aidan Johnston, the director of federal affairs for GEA, GOA, excuse me, stated in the letter, Congress cannot allow the federal government to continue establishing and expanding databases on guns and gun owners. Whether it is the misuse of gun store records and financial data by the Department of Justice or the firearm transaction data by the Department of Treasury, data collection on guns and their lawful owners must be stopped. It was previously reported and suspected that the Treasury Department's Office of Stakeholder Integration and Engagement in the Strategic Operations of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, wow, that is a mouthful, FinCEN, distribute materials to financial institutions that outlined typologies of various persons of interest and provided the banks with suggested search terms and merchant category codes for identifying transactions on behalf of federal law enforcement. In other words, the feds asked banks to search private transactions for terms like MAGA and Trump. Financial institutions were also told to look for transactions with the terms 
including Biden, Kamala, Antifa, White Power, Camp Auschwitz, Proud B. This is a long list, folks. Listen to this. Storm, the Capitol, Groper Army, Threepers, Boogaloo, Civil War, Lost Sons, Kill, Shoot, Gun, Death, Murder, Pelosi, Schumer, and Pence. So once again, once again, under the Biden administration, our government officials actively break the law and impede on the privacy of the American people with no care or concern for their rights or privacy and without provocation. In other unfortunate news, Democrats flipped a seat as Susie won the crucial and critical special congressional election in New York. Made vacant by Santos, Republicans were hopeful to maintain that seat in New York's third congressional district. As you all know, the GOP was hanging on to a razor thin majority in the House as national Republicans and Democrats poured big bucks into that race in suburban New York City, where immigration and border security, crime and abortion were the top issues and where the election was seen as a bellwether ahead of the all but not so certain November White House rematch between Joe Biden and the former president, Donald J. Trump, number 45, whoop, whoop. <laughs> the Long Island district held for a decade by Democrats was flipped by Santos in 2022 midterms, but Santos was ousted from Congress less than a year into his tenure after he was exposed for lying about his background and indicted for a slew of financial crimes. Tom Susi, a former mayor and county executive argued that Pillip, who is in her second term as a county lawmaker, is a far right wing extremist who is totally in line with Johnson and Donald J. Trump. Pillip, an Ethiopian Jew who fled to Israel at age 12 to escape persecution and who later enlisted and served in the Israeli military before immigrating to the United States, has linked Susie to President Biden and blamed him for the migrant crisis in view of his voting record in support of Biden 100% of the time, 90% with the squad. Now, before Susie's win, Republicans held a fragile 219 to 212 majority in the House with four vacancies. This pickup by the Democrats puts the GOP's grip on the chamber in further peril. Republicans, Republicans, Republicans. We better learn how to fight and quick. We gotta get on offense here. You see, Susie is a centrist and moderate Democrat who has cleverly kept his distance from Biden and his party when it comes to immigration. But pay attention to this because this is, this is really important. The contest offers clues to how top issues like immigration and abortion will impact November's elections. A TV ad from the Congressional Leadership Fund, which is the main super PAC supporting House Republicans said, Tom Suzy rolled out the red carpet for illegal immigrants. And a commercial from the House Majority PAC, the top super PAC backing House Democrats, charged that Mozzie Phillip Pillip, excuse me, is running on a platform to ban abortion. Now, what does that tell us? That though immigration is the number one concern for Americans across the board, Republican, Democrat, independent alike, that alone will not win the majority of the American people. We have to put a face to the issue. We have to call them out and connect with a true experience you know, people and faces and families. Need I remind you of the midterm elections of 2022? You know, the one I was in, where crime was out of control and the people voted for abortion and supposed threat to democracy, none of which were actually on the ballot. We gotta get this, people. We gotta pick this up. We gotta, we have to tune in and figure this out. It's, it's really crucial for November. Uh, karma has a face. Have you heard? You know, the news. Have you heard the news? That Sonny Hostin of The View is a descendant of slave owners. <laughs> I love this. The racist Sonny Hostin found out recently to her bigoted dismay 
that she is from a long line of flogging, oppressive, Massa-speaking ancestors. Okay, <laughs> this is juicy. So Sunny marched her race-baiting self onto a PBS program where they look at your ancestries, particularly celebrities, and guess what? Her ancestors were slave owners. They owned Africans. <laughs> it's time to pay up, Sonny. They were slave owners from Spain who actually owned Africans. So when she's making the argument for the never gonna happen reparations, she undoubtedly will be a payor and not a payee. <laughs> I, I love this. Seriously, folks, go look this up, everyone. When she finds out, you gotta look this up. It's, it's, it's all over. When she actually gets the news, she starts squirming and she's scratching her bony, ashy neck and she says, wow, I, 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 oh, I, I guess I'm in shock. I've always thought of myself as half Puerto Rican with ancestry in Spain. Oh, I, I guess this is just a fact of life, how some people have made their living on the backs of others. <laughs> Touche, Sonny. Now, a flood of people dragged her races behind in her DMs, so she went on The View because she knew that everyone saw the results and still argued for reparations, but she was ticked off that people were actually calling her a white woman. <laughs> this is a savage truth right here. Sonny Hostin is a race-baiting hypocrite with slave-owning ancestry of Africans from Spain. She has made a fortune spewing nonsense about white privilege and racial justice, and now she just took a big hit in her credibility and her guest speaking asking fee. <laughs> I love this. I mean, it's gonna be awful awkward from here for her from here on out as she tells the America is racist bit while her direct ancestry actually owned people. Oh my gosh, this is so good. I'm loving it, loving it, moving on. Okay, what else we got? It was a good week for the pickings, folks. I, I had to pick and choose what to bring to you. There was so much, oh yeah. Alejandro Mayorkas became the first cabinet secretary impeached since 1876. The House voted to impeach DS Secretary Mayorkas over border crisis as House Republicans accused Mayorkas of fomenting the border crisis. A cabinet secretary has not been impeached in the U.S. Congress again since 1876. The Office of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said that Mayorkas' impeachment trial would begin later this month. Schumer's office said in a statement the following, and I quote, the House impeachment managers will present the articles of impeachment to the Senate following the state work period. Senators will be sworn in as jurors in the trial the next day. So while Mayorkas is in waiting for the hearing, Senate President Pro Tempore Patty Murray will preside. Tuesday evening's vote marked House Republicans' second attempt at impeaching Mayorkas. GOP lawmakers targeted the Biden official over the ongoing migrant crisis at the U.S. southern border, accusing him of deliberately flaunting existing immigration law and worsening the situation. I mean, with eight, nine, 10 million, again, some people have speculated even more, eight, nine, 10 plus million illegal immigrants in the country, enough to fill the population of 33 states. This is a high crime indeed. This is treason. The 214 to 213 vote was always expected to be tight. Mayorkas narrowly escaped impeachment last week when every single House Democrat showed up to shield him, including Representative Al Green of Texas, who temporarily left the hospital where he was recovering from surgery to simply cast his vote. Three Republicans also voted down the effort, Representative Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, Ken Buck of Colorado, and Tom McClintock of California. Each criticized Mayorkas' handling of the border, but had reservations over whether it rose to the level of impeachment. McClintock warned it could set a precedent for political impeachments that could harm GOP officials in the future. Essentially, their take was that they were following the Constitution and wanted to push impeachment only in cases of high crimes and didn't feel Mayorkas' failure qualified. 
I, of course, beg to differ. You know, I try not to be a knee-jerk decision maker, but when you're talking about 10 million plus illegals, as per your job to protect our country and the American people, it's a serious failure. It's dereliction of duty and a crime against the Constitution. McClintock said, swapping one leftist for another is a fantasy. It solves nothing and excuses Biden's culpability and unconstitutionally expands impeachment that someday will bite Republicans. Speaker Mike Johnson dismissed any concerns about preceding that precedent, saying, Mayorkas is an exceptional case in U.S. history, having done more damage on the country than any cabinet secretary that has ever been seen. He went on to say, the House has a constitutional responsibility. As I've said many times, it's probably the heaviest next to a declaration of war. And we have to do our job regardless of what other chambers do. And I agree. So there were two impeachment articles that were approved against Mayorkas by the House Homeland Security Committee. One accused him of having refused to comply with federal immigration laws and the other of having violated public trust. Mayorkas ducked responsibility for his poor performance in an interview last week. Now he actually finally referred to immigration situation. He referred to this situation actually as a crisis, he actually used that word finally. Now, you know, he was so unwilling to do so countless, as, countless times as he was before Congress and the Senate in the past, he was asked if he bears responsibility for the, bar, for the crisis and he said, it certainly is a crisis and we don't bear responsibility for a broken system and we're doing a tremendous amount within that broken system. But fundamentally, fundamentally, Congress, is the only one who can fix it. Lies, lies. Joe Biden rescinded all the border policies from the Trump administration, the most secure borders in history, and Joe Biden, of course, weighed in on this, saying history will not look kindly on House Republicans for their blatant act of unconstitutional partisanship that has targeted an honorable public servant in order to play a petty political game. But 10 plus million illegal immigrants, unvetted and unaware of their intentions, their whereabouts, their health background, etc., is not a game. The crimes against children, against women, American citizens, our police officers, like in the two in New York we just saw, it's not a game. The stress and the impact on our housing markets, our economy, our judicial system, and our justice system, it's not a game. If Joe Biden and Mayorkas actually cared for the American people, the same standards for immigration they inherited when he took office would have been upheld. I mean, think about this, folks. Joe Biden literally walked into office. He didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was to allow the status quo to continue. That is a savage truth. And we'll just continue to watch as this moves to the Senate. So the greatest, most savage truth of this episode is that Joe Biden, the current president of the United States, has broken the law and has been doing so for quite some time. He is an elderly man in cognitive decline and is unfit to continue now or in the future for another four-year term as president of the United States. If there is anything I want you to take from this episode this week, it's that. Unfit to continue now or in the future for another four-year term as president of the United States. Now, you've all heard about it. You know about the report from the DOJ. And before we get into that quickly, because like I said, there's a lot to cover this week. What a disaster this administration has been. Biden's disastrous start to the month continues to grow even worse. Hunter Biden's former business associate testified, Tony Bobulinski, that Joe Biden is the big guy and said the president continues to lie to the American people about his involvement in his son's business dealings. 
Bob Alinsky, who worked with Hunter Biden to create the joint venture Sinohawk Holdings with Chinese energy company CEFC, and said he met with Joe Biden in 2017, provided unshakable testimony behind closed doors at the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees on Tuesday. His testimony, which came as part of the House impeachment inquiry against President Biden, lasted for more than eight hours. A source familiar with this testimony actually told Fox Digital that he testified that he personally met with Biden in May of 2017 in Los Angeles on the sidelines of the Milken Conference somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. The now infamous May 13, 2017 email, which included a discussion of remuneration packages for six people in a business deal with a Chinese energy firm. The email appeared to identify Biden as chair slash vice chair, depending on agreement with the CFC, in a reference to now bankrupt CFC China Energy Company. The email includes a note that Hunter had some office expectations he will elaborate on. A proposed equity split references 20 for H and 10 held by H for the big guy with no further details. So listen, everyone, listen to this. Bobulinski testified Tuesday that Joe Biden is the big guy. Bobulinski has since 2020 said the big guy was Joe Biden. But IRS whistleblowers Gary Shapley and Joseph Ziegler, who claimed that politics had influenced the years-long federal investigation into Hunter Biden, also said the big guy was known to be Joe Biden. Meanwhile, Bob Alinsky testified that from his direct personal experience, it is clear that Joe Biden was the brand being sold by the Biden family. So this is what he said in his opening statement. Listen to this. His family's foreign influence peddling operation from China to Ukraine and elsewhere sold out to foreign actors who were seeking to gain influence and access to Joe Biden and the United States government. So I just want to let you know that I do find this guy's testimony to be credible. I mean, he has the whistleblowers who testify to the same effect. So who is this guy? Who is this Bobulinski? Well, Bobulinski served in the U.S. Navy's Naval Nuclear Power Training Command as a decorated master training specialist instructor. The command's chief technology officer, holding Q security clearance from the Energy Department and from the National Security Agency, and later served as a direct input officer for the command in his final Navy fitness report. Another source familiar with Bobulinski's testimony told Fox News Digital, which is the source that I actually pulled this from, that he told committee investigators that Jim Biden, the president's brother, was never concerned about the optics of Joe Biden's involvement in the family's foreign business dealings, saying that he could claim plausible deniability. Bobulinski also told congressional lawmakers that he was never approached by the Justice Department or special counsel David Weiss to answer questions on anything related to the Bidens. House Committee Chairman James Comer said in a statement after Bobulinski's testimony, Tony Bobulinski articulated under oath that Joe Biden was the brand the Bidens sold to enrich the family. Joe Biden not only knew about his family's dealings with the Chinese Communist Party, linked ener the linked energy company, but he also enabled them and participated in them. Tony Bobulinski testified he believes Joe Biden committed wrongdoing and continues to lie to the American people about his participation in his family's influence peddling schemes. Comer went on to say, Bobulinski was unshakable in his testimony today, providing facts Democrats don't want to hear. He blasted his Democratic colleagues for behavior that I frankly never seen before in a transcribed interview. As such, Democrats put on a shameful display as they yelled at Bobulinski, cut him off, they belittled him, and threatened him. And as always, in kangaroo court, when Republicans come, 
with irrefutable evidence. This is what happens. Comer said he will soon release the transcripts to provide the American people with the transparency about Joe Biden's involvement in his family's shady schemes and Democrats' effort to smear him for blowing the whistle. But the top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee, Jamie Raskin of Maryland, said, Bobulinski offers absolutely no testimony that indicates any criminal activity by President Biden or evidence that President Biden was involved in Hunter Biden's business. Meanwhile, as Bobulinski left Capitol Hill on Tuesday, he turned to reporters and said, it was a great day for the American people. Next up for the committee as part of the impeachment inquiry is the president's brother, Jim Biden, on February 21st. And then Hunter Biden is expected to appear for his deposition on February 28th. Oh, and by the way, apparently, allegedly, Bob Alinsky offered to testify at Hunter Biden's grand jury, but never heard back. Hmm. Now, as I conclude, as this was a little longer this week, I have to bring up special counsel Robert Herr's comments on Joe Biden. Of course, by now, we've all heard it. It's all everyone is talking about right now. Special counsel Robert Herr described President Biden as a sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory and said he would bring no criminal charges against the president after a month-long investigation into his improper retention of classified documents related to national security. Her's report was made public Thursday afternoon. Her has been investigating Biden's improper retention of classified records since last year. Those records included classified documents about military and foreign policy in Afghanistan, among other records related to national security and foreign policy, which her said implicated sensitive intelligence sources and methods. And I quote here, we conclude that no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. The report also states, we would reach the same conclusion even if the Department of Justice policy did not foreclose criminal charges against a sitting president. But her, in the report, said the special counsel's team also considered that at trial, Joe Biden would likely present himself to a jury as he did during our interview of him as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I quote, and bear with me, because there's a lot to quote here. Based on our direct interactions with observations of him, he is someone from whom many jurors will want to identify reasonable doubt. It would be difficult to convince a jury that they should convict him. By then, a former president well into his 80s of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. Biden's memory also appeared to have significant limitations, according to the report, and during conversations with his ghostwriter, recorded in 2017, his conversations were, and I quote here, painfully slow, with Mr. Biden struggling to remember events and straining at times to read and relay his own notebook entries. Her's report pointed out that Biden's memory was worse during an interview with the special counsel's office. Now, during the interview, Biden did not remember when he was vice president. He forgot on the first day of his interview when his term actually ended. And this is me kind of quoting him a little bit. If it was 20, 2013, when did I stop being vice president? <laughs> and forgetting on the second day of the interview when his term began. In 2009, am, am I still vice president, and I'm still quoting, he did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died, and his memory appeared hazy when describing the Afghanistan debate that was once so important to him. Among other things, he mistakenly said he had a real difference of opinion with General Carl Eikenberry, when in fact, Eikenberry was an ally whom Mr. Biden cited approvingly in his Thanksgiving memo to President Obama's per hers report. Biden, as you know, is 81 years old. Now, we've been saying and seeing this for a while. 
The left saw it as well, but they just didn't want to admit it. They didn't want to acknowledge it. For me, the bigger issue is that while we can all go, aha, we knew it, we told you so, and we can do that because we did. We told them so. The bigger issue is that Joe Biden lied and broke the law. He willfully and knowingly took and possessed classified documents when he was VP and long before that. He broke the law. But because he's old, he won't be held accountable. Now, the two-tiered system of justice as pertained to Donald Trump is the true crime here, if you ask me. Of course, Joe Biden agreed with the DOJ's charges. He was in total agreement with that part when it's charging Trump. But that same report that called into question his own cognition and competency, he got ticked off and snapped at reporters for bringing it up. He became indignant and agitated. How dare he? I don't need a reminder of my son's death. Now, according to the DOJ, Joe is too old to be held accountable. But the 81-year-old year old who was in attendance at the Capitol on January 6th was accused of being a rioter and sentenced to three years of probation. I guess that's a little different. Apparently, according to Dems and the DOJ, Joe Biden is too old and too senile to recall important dates, times, or understand the weight and impact of specific crimes with declining cognition but he's perfectly suited for the highest job on the planet. Makes perfect sense to me. Joe Biden's presidency is over. Okay, let me just, let me just, it's over. Let me just put that out there. He is essentially rendered as too old and too senile to lead. He is convicted without being charged for his mishandling of classified documents, and then, in a hurried and contentious appearance, gives the most disastrous press conference in American history. KJP provided no relief to the situation, as she usually doesn't, as she squirmed and gave laughable excuses to explain Joe Biden's obvious ineptitude. It was a shocking day in American politics and will continue to be that kind of presidency if he won't decide himself to step down or, as we can all foresee, someone on the other side of the aisle to do it for him. It's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out. Remember though, and don't forget folks, we all have a role in the outcome this coming November. Please like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review. And remember, even if Joe can't, be strong, be bold, be faithful, be true. Till next time, I'm Cicely Davis. The Savage Truth with Cicely Davis is a production of Front Page Magazine and the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.